Robot Talk is the podcast that sits down with robot enthusiasts from around the world and asks them the questions you always wanted answered. Like, can we be friends with robots? And how does that thing work? everyone. Welcome to Robot Talk. I'm your host, Claire Asher, and this week we're delving into the social side of robotics and AI and considering how these new technologies are impacting society, for better or worse. Before that, I'd like to remind you to subscribe to Robot Talk through your favourite podcast provider. It really helps the podcast and means you'll be the first to hear the latest episodes. Another way to find out about new episodes is our email newsletter, which you can sign up to on our website by going to robottalk.org. And don't forget to enter our t-shirt competition for a chance to win your very own Robot Talk t-shirt. All you have to do is share your favourite episode on social media and tag us at Robot Talk Pod. So, let's get on with this week's interview. I recently had a fascinating chat with Kate Devlin from King's College London about the social and ethical implications of new robotics and AI technology. We touch on a range of different topics, from concerns over job losses and privacy, to issues of inequality, trust and power. In the second half of the interview, we talk a bit about robotics, AI and relationships. The conversation isn't graphic or explicit at all, In fact, we end up focusing more on friendship and companionship than anything else. But if you'd prefer to give that part of the conversation a miss, you can stop the podcast at around 22 minutes, when you hear the music. With all that said, I hope you enjoy my chat with Kate as much as I did. Today I'm speaking to Kate Devlin, a reader in AI and Society at King's College London, investigating how people interact with and react to technologies both past and future. Hi, Kate. I'm excited to have you on the podcast. Thank you very much for having me on. So your research career path is particularly interesting, I think, because, you know, you started out studying archaeology, then moved into computer science, and now you work in robotics. So talk me through, you know, what what made you decide to move into working with computers and robotic technology? It's a bit of a circuitous journey. So yes, I started off with an undergraduate degree in archaeology and I really enjoyed that. And I worked for a year as an archaeologist mm. and I found it fascinating just looking at the impact of technology on human lives down the centuries and how things change over time. And then I really wanted to get into a job where there was a bit more job security because at the time archaeology was working contract to contract on sites. Mm. So I decided to do computer science alongside that because that allows you to merge the two disciplines. And so I went back and did a conversion course master's degree and then started working as a programmer for a while. That was quite short lived. I did not really <laughs> enjoy that. Um, <laughs> so database programmer, I was doing a lot of work in COBOL. It was fine. It was interesting enough. But, you know, at the end of the day, I really wanted to do research. So I went back and did a PhD. My PhD was in computer science. Mm. And then from then on, I was kind of working in a foot in both fields, really but a lot more towards human-computer interaction. And from that, doing work on cognitive systems and AI. So I got very into the sort of perceptual side of things. How does the visual system work? Um, How how do we process information? What even is consciousness? All that kind of stuff. (laughs) And yeah, just just those light questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And then (laughs) I find more and more that I was doing work on, on AI, which I really liked. And, you know, that fits so well with robotics. Um, that there was a lot of overlap and Mm. began working on research projects that essentially were focused on AI and robotics. And so here I am, some 23 years since starting my PhD. And yeah, that's the field I find myself in. So I look at the social impact that that technology has, and it combines that archaeology side because I look at the impact technology has on our lives and the things that we create and what happens to them. Yeah. Yeah. I always really like talking to people who work in robotics but didn't start out in that field. I think it gives you 
a, a really different perspective on things. Um, and so I was interested to hear your thoughts on how robotics and AI are different from some of the other technological revolutions that we've been through as a species, or perhaps how they're the same. Oh, that is a fascinating question. And it's so, so interesting. So we've been trying to create technology to make people's lives easier since the moment humans picked up sticks and started poking <laughs> things with them. Yeah. So technology is really just about trying to reduce our labor. And you know, we saw massive advances in what's termed the first industrial revolution. And that was when factories um, started emerging. So we start seeing uh, people being replaced to produce things mass market and and you know there was a lot of talk around then and a lot of action over job loss because people were losing the skills to machines losing, losing their work and we have things like the luddite movement that went in to smash up the looms in factories not mm. not because they were scared of the machines but because they saw the the problems with people's work being taken away and, and automation coming in and so we've seen several of these revolutions we saw uh, the uptake then of, of digital technologies and how that's changed things and electricity even actually after after the, the first one and now we're in this sort of what's been termed the fourth industrial revolution and, and we are poised to see a lot of job loss but also job creation so mm. it's not just going to be job loss because we've been automating jobs for so long now um, and new ones spring up. It's not always immediate. The difference this time around is the sheer scale of it. So it is, it has huge reach that it probably didn't have before. Mm. And also, <laughs> also it's not coming for the, the more skilled jobs, the middle class jobs. I, I hate this phrase skilled work as if the work people isn't, are doing yeah. isn't skilled. But in that kind of class um, hierarchy, you know, it's the job, it's the, when it's not coming for the white collar jobs, the jobs mm. that, that people thought were safe like law, uh, like creative work. So that's very interesting too. Yeah, yeah. I, I do have my reservations about that. I feel like, you know, what we've seen in the past with technological revolutions a lot of the time and, and what I hope to see from robotics and AI is taking over those jobs that are dangerous or repetitive, that humans aren't naturally necessarily very good at, and kind of leaving the creative things, the things we enjoy doing alone. And at the moment, I feel like we're teetering on the edge of, of crossing that line. Yeah, I think there is an element of that. And a lot of people are quite worried about that. Although if you start talking to people, you find that elements of their jobs, if they are in a creative role, a lot of it comes down to human judgment that AI or, or robotics is not yet capable of mm. doing. So we still have that element to our advantage. But yes, you know, the whole point of creating robotics for to, to automate tasks was because it would erase the dull, dirty and dangerous jobs. Um, and yeah, now it's expanding more and more into the dull ones. <laughs> um, and, you know, maybe not so much the dangerous or the dirty. So we we know that there is scope for robotics to be used in areas like care, but it's just much, much more difficult. So we still very much reliant on human carers and a human workforce there because mm. robots just aren't really up to that yet. And, and it could be quite a while before they are. Yeah. So, I mean, we've already touched on this idea of, of job losses, um, which I don't know if it's comforting that this has been a theme throughout our technological history or not, but um, you know, that's one thing I hear a lot of concerns about robotics and AI. Um, another aspect of it is like a loss of privacy and, you know, control over their data as as robots kind of become more integrated into our lives. Um, I had a conversation a couple of seasons back about ro robots in caring roles and obviously taking in a lot of data about that person who they're caring for and what happens to that data and do we trust the companies that own that data to to treat it carefully? Um, so these kind of social and ethical issues, I think, come up over and over again and are both as important and as interesting as the engineering side of things. Um, how do you kind of approach these issues? I mean, that is the key question. Do we trust these companies? A lot of people don't. This is this is the problem. They might actually be okay with the technology, but they have mm. huge doubts about what those companies are going to do with their data. And privacy is an enormous issue. And yeah, I think that that is a really big problem. And one where we're seeing an erosion of privacy, 
that we are really feel a little bit powerless when we're up against it. So, I mean, one of the things that freaks me out a little, it doesn't seem to bother quite a lot of people, are things like surveillance doorbells. Mm, <laughs> so yeah. things like a ring doorbell, they're capturing so much data and that data is going back to a company and that company can do what it likes with it. Um, but it's also leading to these weird social phenomena like vigilante groups who are posting mm. data of citizens, private citizens online. And I just find that really quite bizarre. Um, and if you think about all the data that's being collected about us every day, um, how conscious are we in our choices around that? Mm. I wear a fitness tracker and I know where that data goes, um, but I still clicked on the terms and conditions to accept it, even though I'm not you know, 100% convinced I really want it. But I know that that fitness tracker, the data that is collected, has been used um, to generate new medical insight. But that's medical insight from a particular group of users, people who are privileged enough to yeah. own a famous tracker. That's not a representative sample of the population. And so are we going to get this feedback loop where it's the people who can afford these devices who get to make the choices and whose data is used to improve them? And if so, we're leaving out huge sectors of society. Mm. And we already know we do that because it's a very western thing anyway and ai and robotics is incredibly technocratic it's steered ai especially is steered from silicon valley and the tech companies there so we aren't seeing this being rolled out fairly or equally there's a long way to go before we have any kind of fairness in these systems not just in the algorithms themselves but much much wider in social mm. terms yeah and your your point about the video doorbells uh and that makes me think as well about somebody pointed out to me, um, like uh, robotic vacuum cleaners. A lot of them create a map of your whole house, which, you know, I don't know what use that is to a company, but I can see what use it might be to a burglar. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I guess a lot of this comes back to this idea that the technology itself is not good or bad. It's it's how it's used, because you also see cases where crimes have been solved because of data that was captured by these video doorbells, right? Like, so you see, you can see a good side and a bad side to it. There is, it is a trade-off. At the same time, I'm, I'm not convinced that technology is necessarily neutral because there were so many choices made along the way yeah. in determining what should be made in the first place. Mm. So the decisions to pursue these lines of engineering or, and, and it's driven very much by the market, by, by money-making. So the choices that are made all along are, they're kind of out to capitalize on, on the technology to get a good return on the things that have been made. So rather than thinking it's neutral, um, I, I do, but I, I completely see what you mean though. There are there are, there are positives to it. Uh, it's not always about the bad actors and what they can do. And we've certainly seen wonderfully advantageous things come out of it hmm. um, in terms of healthcare and improving diagnostics, for example. It's been really, really good. There's use of um, AI and robotics in agriculture, which can do amazing things. You can use AI to analyze satellite images to find out when's a good time to plant or to harvest, for example, um, for emergencies and disaster. That's incredible. And yet, yes, with it comes these negatives. Um, but throughout it all, we can't put the technology back in the box. And, and mm. a lot of people are saying, you know, maybe we should be more cautious. Well, yeah, we should be more cautious. We should think about it, but we can't make it go away. We can't just say, oh, well, let's let's uninvent it because that's not going to happen. And yeah. the kind of calls there have been in the past few months about moratoriums on AI development, I'm a bit cynical about those because mm. they tend to come from companies who are already leading the way. Exactly. And then yeah. say, no, we should pause about it while we're at the top, <laughs> which is just a little bit self-serving. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely think we we have to be cautious. Um, but our, we, again, and I'm saying we, and I'm speaking as one of the people who is fortunate enough to be able to, to work on this. And AI is incredibly technocratic. So we have this power imbalance whereby the people with the most power are the companies that are creating the, the artifacts or the algorithms. And the people like me, like anyone working in the sphere that have an understanding of it, we, we have some power as well, but it's mm. being used all around the world on people who might be 
subject to a system, but never actually be able to feed into it or give their views on it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, you you can choose whether or not you buy certain robotic products for your home, but you can't necessarily choose whether it's introduced in your workplace. So like there's a lot of places where people don't have really a say in the matter or exactly that's completely true and and things like um cameras you know we we live in in the uk one of the most surveilled countries in europe and there's talk of the police using um facial recognition or predictive policing that's not something that we get much say over we can push back against Mm. it and we can be activists and we can speak out against it um but you know, we haven't had a say in designing or deploying those systems. So there is quite a bit of resistance in some areas towards this, and, and rightly so. We should be critical of these systems being unleashed without our approval of them. Yeah, there was an interesting one in, in the US the other week when um, I think it was in New York. I might be wrong about that. Um, but the police announced that they were going to use drones to fly over people's gardens and, and essentially spy on them. Which, yeah, I mean... Yeah, that's just... what? That, why? I mean, it's just such an invasion of privacy. Even this, this whole thing about bringing robots onto the streets for the police as well. I mean, that's been fascinating. So San Francisco, I think it was, wanted to bring out policing robots. We've seen um, bringing out things like, like the boss and dynamic spot, mm. you know, which is... I don't know. When you see things like that up close, I mean, I, I know what spot the robot is capable of and those those dog robots are capable of i know they can be steered i know they're pretty good you know a lot of them are being controlled remotely yeah uh there a lot of them aren't working autonomously um those things can climb stairs really well yeah <laughs> it's quite just quite surprising when i first thought but even though i know and I've, I've been in the vicinity and i've controlled one there's something very in the in the sort of primal fear you feel like something in you thinks oh that is almost aggressive and it is its shape its stance the way it moves around and it's quite scary so to kind of think that those could be normalized on the streets that's weird to me because the reaction is we we do zoomorphize we do anthropomorphize uh the robots that we encounter um and to have robots walking around among us when we know when they are in a position of authority in terms of you know, policing and things like that I find that quite scary and intimidating, possibly mm. primed by years of watching sci-fi yeah. films. But there is something about that, that that rests uneasily with me, I think. Yeah. You either get that reaction or I, I'm just thinking back to some of those attempts at kind of COVID policing robots that happened, you know, like social distancing robots where, I mean, they would just malfunction and people, they start to, be- <laughs> to become a subject of ridicule rather yeah. than kind of any sort of authority. There's that as well, isn't there? So it, it, it's quite interesting how quickly it falls down. So when you see all of these human robotic interaction trials, a lot of them are lab based, which is great. But then you roll them out in in a human environment, and suddenly it's just not quite as easy to do once it's outside yeah. of those more controlled situations. And when you see if you've just got a handful of people interacting, great. What happens if you put them in a crowd and a lot of people, like you say, start ridiculing these robots yeah. or finding ways to subvert them? Yeah, it's interesting. Mm. Um, I think the points you've been making about inequality are are so important to to think about and address early on like what what do you think we should be doing now to try and make sure that robotics is a force for good and and reduces inequality rather than exacerbating it it's really difficult because there probably needs to be a bit of a shift in the way that the way that these things are designed deployed regulated uh, there's there's quite a big push for responsible research and innovation, and I work on a, a large mm. project, UKRI project, that is all about responsible research and innovation, and I have done for the past few years. So I worked on the Trustworthy Autonomous Systems Hub, and that was all about looking at ways that machines, autonomous systems, could be trustworthy, both from a safety verification perspective, but also from a user perspective or mm. a participant perspective. So what happens? If you encounter a system, do you feel trust? Why do you feel trust? How do you feel trust? So where's the acceptance from the user? But it's really interesting because different groups of people involved in designing these systems 
have very different ideas of what trustworthy means. So mm. I was at ICRA um, conference a few months ago and we had a panel talking about trust and autonomous systems. And, you know, the, the, the robotics engineer there was talking about trust from a safety verification perspective. The lawyer was talking about trust from a legal perspective. And I was talking about trust from a psychological perspective. Mm. And all of us were talking completely cross purposes until we sat down and tried to work out exactly what we meant. Um, but I think that's a very, very key thing. It's knowing that the systems have been designed to take into consideration these issues, issues around power and equality, around fairness uh, and around trust. Yeah. And I guess sometimes people can, like the concept of whether or not a user trusts a robot or trusts the AI, that can be misplaced, right? We can trust something even though it's not trustworthy. Absolutely. That's another aspect of it as well. Yeah. So we can have misplaced faith in the system or we can have faith that the system works, but the company behind it might not have our best interests at heart. So, yeah, it's mm. a really difficult one to unpick. Yeah. Well, it's, I've had these conversations with quite a lot of interviewees and it is reassuring to know that at least roboticists have it on their mind, whether, you know, we get everything right or not. I think, you know, that will remain to be seen, but at least it's um, it's being taken into consideration. Yeah, I think it is. It's getting it's getting better. Um, I would love to see universities introduce this kind of thing on computer science courses, for example, or engineering courses, mm. where you have to engage with ethics, not just as a separate module where you learn about how things can go wrong, but to have it embedded in all the design work that goes on and the development work that goes on, because it really, really is key. And it should be at the forefront of our mind. It should run right through everything we do. Mm. Do you think it is more prevalent in robotics than AI, perhaps because roboticists, because a robot moves around in the world and can physically hurt someone, you start thinking about that element of safety and it sort of more naturally leads into it? Yeah, possibly, actually. Um, Definitely the physical aspects, I think psychologically um, or in terms of wider social impact and, and in terms of things like discrimination and bias, AI is probably more conscious of that because of the awful things that have occurred. Yeah. Um, and yes, but I think robotics definitely is very aware of the physical um, issues that would arise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So another major theme that you've covered in your work, which I don't think any of my previous guests have worked on, is technology and intimacy. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about your work in this area? I have really enjoyed working on robotics, AI and intimacy. It's just been an absolutely fascinating glimpse into what makes us human. Uh, because mm. to, in order to build systems that we can relate to emotionally, we have to understand a lot about ourselves um, and it's a it's a wonderful reflection on on humans and humanity and so I started there about, probably about eight years ago uh, I was looking at all these headlines about sex and robotics and I was very doubtful that the things that papers were saying <laughs> were even remotely true <laughs> even from a purely technological engineering robotic standpoint it just didn't seem right so I did a bit of a deep dive into it and ended up writing a book about it and what was really striking was that I started off investigating robots in terms of people, people's anticipation of having robots that you could have a sexual relationship with. But very quickly, it was apparent that it was companionship that mm. people were interested in alongside that or even instead of that. So it was it was almost more love that people were interested in. Yeah. And it's very easy to get attached to things that seem human we know this from a number of studies there's the eliza effect for example where people very quickly confide in chatbots or anything mm. that seems to have a vaguely human response but we don't even need that we can still if there's a semblance of anthropomorphism or zoomorphism then we immediately feel this connection so anything that behaves socially or seems to have a degree of animism we relate to and actually when you start looking at how people relate to systems, and in particular, what's been quite interesting is the rise of AI and more and more sophisticated chatbots. Yeah. People very quickly get engaged and become 
become friends with the chatbot, even when they know it's not real. Mm. And that is fascinating. There's a suspension of disbelief. There's a buying into the illusion and not in a, not in a negative way, but in a, a way that is comfortable for the user. And, you know, who are we to say that that's necessarily a bad thing if you befriend a chatbot? Sure, it's not a human, it's not a human-human relationship. It's not anything like that. I don't think it's, it's going to replace it. It's something of its own. It's something emergent. And we're seeing mm. that more and more. We're seeing this social category, as Julie Carpenter puts it in her research, a social category where um, we become friends with, we interact with robots, with AIs um, in, a, on a, in a new way where they are their own thing and we're aware of what they are, we're aware of the limitations and still we choose to interact as if they're mm. like us. So it has been a really, really interesting glimpse into that and into the idea of machines as friends even which I know people get quite alarmed about sometimes. I actually don't think it's as bad as people think it is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it for for certain portions of society, loneliness is is a huge problem and it's it really reduces people's quality of life. So, you know, if if a person is is getting something that they need from an AI or from a robot and that they're not getting in the rest of their life, then it seems cruel to tell them that that's wrong or that they can't have that yeah if people if people are getting something out of it then I don't see it as being a problem I know there's a lot a lot of others who would disagree and say no absolutely they should be having real life friends well yes of course that's probably the gold standard it's what we all expect it's what we all hope for for some people maybe they don't necessarily want that and for some people maybe they can't easily get that and is it How much more different is it than coming home from work, putting on the TV or putting on the radio because you want to hear the sounds of other people. You want to have that feeling of other people around you. And you can do that with the chatbot. And there are limitations to it. I would worry if people were solely dependent on that Mm. and it hindered them from being in the real world. But actually, uh, a lot of people are reporting that when they have these AI companions, and for example, there's a there's an AI chatbot that, where you can have this kind of remote virtual girlfriend or boyfriend. And people are saying it helps me because I'm anxious to do this in the real world. It gives me a chance to practice before I go into the real world. Yeah. Or it's a chance to, you know, explore uh how I how I interact before I yeah, make new friends in real life. So yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um and and I see it as being a reasonably positive thing if it if it helps people. Yeah. I guess the AI side of things is a lot more advanced at this point than the robotics side of things. I mean, I've I've having spoken to people who try and make humanoid robots, the challenges that still remain are huge. Yeah. Yeah, so that was very interesting. So I used to go with get these people saying, but you know, uh, these these robots, the, our robot, perfect robot companion is almost here. And I had to break it to them that no, they are not almost here. It is so incredibly difficult to make a humanoid robot that I don't really know why anyone would bother. Um, it's technologically difficult. It's computationally expensive. It's financially expensive. Um, and it just doesn't look right. So we have the uncanny valley effect yeah. and we know that it's going to look not quite right. So why do we persevere in trying to do that? And actually, there's lots of success with social robots that don't look human, but yeah. may have human or animal like attributes, you know, big eyes. That's always a good one. That makes people feel trust, makes people feel like they care for it. Mm. There's kind of the, the baby schema of cute faces. So, you know, this push to try and do humanoid robots, I always think it's really, really misplaced. Sure, we are in a human world. It would be useful to have robots that can incorporate our human architecture and tools and things like that. But actually, if we think of robots as having specific domains, much, much easier to abstract it to those domains than to try and make a humanoid robot. Yeah. And if you're looking for kind of long-term companionship, I mean, I've seen some humanoid robots that are pretty impressive to just look at for a moment. But when you add in like the having to interact with you and it just, it it breaks down very, very quickly, I think. It does. And so I think that's why we see much more success in companionship terms from robots like Paro, uh, which is a scene cub, 
or mm. the little you know Jibo that was an attempt at a social robot that that unfortunately ended, leaving a lot of people feeling quite bereft that they'd lost their little robot friend. Yeah. Uh, so these feelings are very strong. Um, but yes, to try and make something not like a human, to make it its own thing, I think that's much more chance of success there. Yeah. Kate, it's been really fun chatting to you today. I've been talking to Kate Devlin, a reader in AI and society at King's College London. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy Robot Talk, I'd really appreciate it if you could share the podcast and leave a review to let us know what you think. And if you've got a question you'd like me to ask one of my future guests, you can contact us on social media at robottalkpod or visit robottalk.org. We regularly announce upcoming guests and I'd love to include your robotics questions, whether they're super basic, a bit silly, or even quite profound, in my next interview. Next week... I'll be talking to Lorenzo Yamone from Queen Mary University of London about robotic hands, dexterity, and the sense of touch. Until then, I've been Claire Asher, and this has been Robot Talk. Robot Talk is brought to you by the Hamlin Centre, Imperial College, London.